You're very welcome along to World and Union Balls at E's weekly rugby show with me, Mick McCarthy, alongside Morris Brosnan. Today, we're, um, we have a great show today, actually. I'm really looking forward to it. We're going to speak to Paddy Butler, the former Munster number 8, who's now playing in France in the top 14 with Poe. We remember a few weeks ago, we spoke to um, James Collin, who's the academy coach there. Another former Munster number 8. Uh, it's just that they're attracting them there. In, in, <laughs> yeah, in, back in, rows. Sean yeah. Dugas there as well, yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. So Poe are taking them up. So really looking forward to catching up with Paddy. We're going to talk to him a little bit about life in France and the Irish kind of tree that's developing around the top 14 of, you know, mainly former Munster players, really, isn't it? Yeah, Duncan Casey's there in Grenoble as well, and John Ryan is playing with Berritz, I think, as a prop there too. So, yeah, there's uh, there's plenty to bounce there, right? Yeah. So, we're going to get to that in a few minutes, but also um, today we're going to pick, well, Morris is going to pick his team that's going to... Um, hopefully be selected against Scotland against um, Italy this weekend so we'll see whether he wants to go experimental or whether uh, you know we want to get things back on track in the Six Nations I suppose it's actually up to Joe Schmidt as opposed to <laughs> Morris but you know for the for the purposes of the next 40 minutes or so we're going to let Morris be in charge of Irish rugby and, and, and see what you want to do but uh, before we get to any of that we're back I, 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 people who listen regularly will know what I'm talking about when I say the streak is back we started again. And then I realised it was because we were too worried about what was happening in Europe. It's like, it's the Pro 14 where it's all at. Yeah. And every time we've, you know, four out of four for the Irish provinces in, in the Pro 14, it's not unusual. And we definitely had it this week because Munster won 43 nil. Leinster had a good, like, 20, 30 point win over Zebra. Um, Ulster had a, um, a, a almost a nil all stalemate a against t- yeah a tense eight nil win yeah. eight nil win against the Ospreys and or was this was it the Ospreys yeah, it, it was, was the yeah. Ospreys sorry I, I doubted myself there for a second having <laughs> seen a lot of that game I've actually seen people give it there was a big debate actually on after that game on um, Welsh rugby Twitter yeah. about the future of Welsh rugby and I did see somebody say that I don't like teams who play in black which is a kind of, you know, it, of all the problems that's going on in the Welsh <laughs> regions, I'm not sure that uh, the the former Neath Swansea Ospreys <laughs> playing in all black is exactly their problem. But anyway, yeah, they lost the old straight deal. But also, the, something, the thing you wanted to talk about most of all was that it's another fine win for Connacht. And Connacht absolutely flying yeah, this season. It's not so much the results as it is just Connacht in general this season that we kind of... I wanted to kind of touch on because I remember a couple of weeks ago I said on this podcast that I think Connacht are the best coach team in Ireland and yeah. kind of got a couple of funny looks at the time and then, <laughs> from me and, then, <laughs> and even or even a couple of things that were said on Twitter and yeah. even since then like I looked over it there out of their last 12 games they've won nine any game that they lost was by less than seven points uh. in that so that there's a degree of consistency that was just totally lacking over but you have to take in like in total such I think they're both the best coach team in Ireland and also the most improved team in Europe like the looking across people might say Harlequins but I mean Harlequins were 10th last year because they were awful like they they, mm. they had in terms of the players that are at their disposal whereas what you see with Connacht like as a in context if you put it in structure there's there's such a well coached team and even the way they like they back, if you look at that game for example the very first try that they score is like every there's total clarity in what they're supposed to do like every single run that they have so if you look at that like Tom Farrell is cutting a the line there's a winger coming in behind him but the call is very clearly laid out it's the same thing for their scrum I know they conceded three tries but if you actually look at the tries there it's like a man being beaten on the outside or it's like a grubber kick in behind and a winger just not having that degree of pace to catch up like that's not down to coaching the coaching is you know you maximize the utensils at your, at yeah. your disposal so so you're saying like that any other team that's improved as much like Quinns have you know opened the checkbook and uh, they, well, they've come back up to the mean you know yeah Quinns, like, quick, quick, Carl Sinclair was playing at wins like the Harlequins have got like a phenomenal roster of players that last year went disastrously bad in the end yeah. of getting rid of their but Connacht are ultimately doing things with the same group of players or a similar group of players than they were but they're just playing at far above the level that they were yeah, last like, season I mean I think the, the, last, the biggest problem last season was their lack of consistency I mean they, they actually were they yeah. showed in, in flashes their quality and then yeah. on the other side this year I remember uh, Brett Wilkinson who used to play for Connacht and then he coached us in club rugby he used to uh, like he was a defence maniac and he used to always say never ever get beaten on the inside like if you're going to get beaten at least let it happen out wide you know and all three of the tries kind of can see at the weekend were from out wide like there wasn't a systems failure there wasn't you know miscommunication or n- nobody understanding the system it was just that 
you know somebody lacked pace out wide or yeah. they got caught slightly for numbers but it was it was never like as an overall hierarchy if you watch their the way their their play this good off the line I think their line out creativity is really interesting Jimmy mm. Duffy is coaching them there like the, you use a guy like Golden to the land as an extra back row almost to crash up and stuff like that I just I think that as a setup we spoke to Dylan Turney Martin we spoke to him previously the under 20s who's t- told us like he's a young who wasn't number eight he's now been converted to a hooker they've they set up a mentor program so he's working with you know Dave Heffernan he's essentially taking him under his wing to develop along that he mm. said that he can't imagine there's a better place in w- rugby to be than in sports ground as an academy player because of the the vibe there you know wow. it's like it's a it's an atmosphere like and that that's a trend that has come across like w- widely you know we spoke to on actually it's up on site uh, on Bozzari Robin Copeland's spoke at the start of the year about the difference between Kieran Keane and Andy Friend and he said you know like I think he said it was like chalk and cheese like the there was a real kind of people didn't certainly take to Kieran Keane and he mm. didn't really work to make that up whereas Andy Friend has brought that back like there's a sense of this Pat Lamb thing of yeah. ever being you know incorporating everybody I, I know the team doctor and he has to be there for the captain's run because he does the captain's run with the team it's, it's a unit like there's a there's a collective ethos there I just think as a like I'm not just talking about you know I think you have to look beyond results and look at the context of what they have at their disposal and how they're effectively maximizing you know yeah I, that's an interesting thing about Pat Lamb I remember talking like doing a thing with Gavin Duffy years ago I think it might have been Pat Lamb's second season and he was talking about how they'd all been given a rugby ball that they had to mind like a child yeah um and you know and you know I know that's silly and it's a it's a gimmick in itself but Duffy and all of the players, by all accounts, had bought completely into this because they just believed in what he was doing. And that obviously led to what would happen a year later when they would go on and, and, and win the league remarkably for like a team like Connacht, you know. And it just does seem like that this is a group of players, and obviously it changes over time and it's not all the same players, that is... Um, that is set up, basically, to have a kind of a charismatic, involved coach and for them then and that's just not what happened last year and it kind of it does slightly go against your point though about like separating them from say some like harlequins or whatever report last year because connacht for all their lack of resources and everything else massively underperformed last year oh I given the talent that they have at their disposal you know so they have come back to the mean in a way as well but are now kind of possibly kicking on to sort of start outperforming it in the way they did in 2016 again yeah I agree and I mean just to circle back to that point quickly about the balls like that stuff sounds gimmicky like Pat Lamb giving them a rugby ball to carry yeah I I didn't mean to be disparaging about it either I just mean mean, it's not to be all end I think like there's like one of the trends we spoke to Ian Costello last week who referenced a Steve Kerr's uh, interview on Mastery Podcast and on that podcast Steve Kerr talked about the idea one of the most important things to him when he came to the Warriors in basketball was that they celebrate every single member of the organization's birthday. So if you're the secretary or if you're the Steve Cur- Steph Curry, there's a big party for you. And the reason that is because everybody was as important. It was about an ethos within. It was just it was extended beyond that. Like I think the best coaches aren't just concerned with the, the you know on field the rugby thing. They're concerned with the whole environment. Yeah. They're concerned with everything. I think that's what like a lot of Pat Lamb was built on. You know, like shaking hands with everybody that when you met them in the morning, that kind of stuff. Like it sounds. Yeah. Like it's, it sounds kind of trivial, but I think it's it's part of something much bigger. Like it's Definitely. the idea of trying to create kind of an environment that uh, is clearly kind of fostering in. In Connacht. Yeah, definitely. Actually, Morris mentioned the in Costello um, interview there. If um, you ever want to go back, there's a good archive of World and Union, all available in our uh, podcast feed. If you search for balls.e on iTunes or wherever it is that you get your podcasts, we're all there. But that Ian Costello one in particular was a little bonus show that we had for you last week. It wasn't video. It was an extra show. Uh, he's the assistant coach at Wasps. And it really was, I have to say, just the mo- one of the most enjoyable interviews we've done. Um, I really, really loved it. I've listened back to it. Ian is a fascinating guy, and I'll definitely be keeping more of an eye on. And what's one at the weekend? Didn't the they? Day, we were yeah, watching the Bristol, yeah. Bristol yeah. yeah. So yeah, it was just it was. I mean, it was a masterclass breakdown of an aspect of the game that you don't really understand. Like you, yeah. you see defensive setups, but you don't like nobody breaks down to you how obsessive they are in training. The idea that you're thinking about asleep when you're doing conditioning work, you're talking about line speed within that, and Ian kind of. The, pull back the curtain there and kind of showed us that so yeah it was it was brilliant as well we're checking out yeah definitely look back on that if you can just before we back, move on to Paddy uh, how good do you think Connacht can be or like how, like what's Connacht's ceiling at the moment like they're, they're hopefully 
for them, for their point of view, we won't bring Ulster into this or anything at the moment or whoever, but they they the hope for Champions Cup qualification. They're probably good enough to compete at that level. Yeah, I actually, yeah, I think that's actually if, for, if, on this team. I think that's a like that's a must. I actually think they they have to qualify for the Champions Cup. They have to kick on from that. Whether that's by like there is a really enticing prospect that they'll meet Bristol. Pat Lamb will come back to the sports ground in the semi final if they can bulk it over their qualifiers mm. in the in the uh, Challenge Cup. But beyond, I I think. To kick on in Europe is is kind of that has to be a prerequisite. Like there has to be like t- tangible results from like all this stuff is great and it is great. Like there's no denying that. But for it to be you know consolidated, I think uh, they have to get to. And I think they're good enough to do that as well. That's yeah. what I'm asking. You think yeah. that I think that there's the like from what I've seen of them and I haven't looked. And it's the unfortunate t- truth with Connacht is that you just actually don't see as many of their games. You do as a Connacht man, obviously, as you would Munster, Leinster, or even Ulster to an extent, especially when you're seeing Ulster yeah. in all of their their uh, Champions Cup games. But from what I've seen of Connacht this year, the two or three times, and unfortunately, it's been an in interpros a lot of the time, and all, they've just been, as you said, like so organised, so like every, everything about them seems like they're just really, really well coached. But they're very, very competitive as well. They don't. I don't think you know. You you mentioned the stat earlier. This doesn't look like a team that's ever going to get a heavy beating. Yeah, no, and you know? like, and even like on actually, that's it's an interesting point you make there because on that, like, there there is tangible evidence that like somebody like the, I mean, the I think one of the best results of this was that when Joe Schmidt recognized it and called up like recalled Ulton Delan and yeah. Jack Carthy and Tom Farrell, like, Caelan Blades, the the scrum half, all these guys who like um would have been like without being disparaging would have been considered kind of tier players, and yeah. you've seen them like really burgeon and kind of kick on there within, and that like. That is, I think, something that Connacht could actually build on. Like that could be a trademark. Like the idea that if you come here, like we will, you will absolutely maximize yourself as a yeah. player. You think you've got a ceiling. Wait until you come here and you discover like that's tenfold more than what you thought it was. Yeah. Like, like I like kick, like just to go back to Caelan Blade quickly. Caelan Blade was well behind Kieran Marmion. Like he would have been third choice in Connacht before he slowly developing. They'd call in guys from Corinthians um, Rugby Club to play in Europe. And this year, the difference in them is phenomenal. Like not the, the, the another guy who's like a similar growth like that is Jack Harty. Like Jack Harty, yeah. the exact same extent, who has like changed his game effectively. He's mm. become this kicking out half and it's, it's I saw Jack Harty play the year they won the league and he was he was a replacement for AJ McGinty and he isn't the player he wasn't yeah, he the was, player he is now at mm-hmm. all. You just didn't think he was going to develop into this which is like borderline international class at the moment. And, yeah. and the f- just the final point in this, like you mentioned the idea like I, I would actually encourage people to watch Connor because they're a really enjoyable team to watch. Yeah. And on top of that, there's like there's really creative innov- like innovations around their games. At the weekend, uh, they seem to be always the ones that work with TG Cahir to allow them access to their dressing room before the game, so they can see the referees briefing with the scrum. Just a nice little insight, you know. Like it's always this stuff seems to always involve a, a Connacht game. Connacht yeah. televised their if games aren't televised. They show the games on their website, and you don't you don't need to pay anything. You just sign up. Like there, there's kind of a nice bit of creativity behind the club as well that makes it kind of worthwhile to. Uh, to jump on the bad bang and you know yeah and this Connacht uh, infomercial has been brought to you by uh, <laughs> former Connacht underage player Morris Brosnan but <laughs> now we, we fully endorse it we fully endorse uh, a great club and wish them all the best obviously as we go on but we are going to now go to um, Paddy Butler who's on the line who all the way from um, Poe in France Paddy how are you yeah not too bad how's everyone keeping over there over that side of the world not too bad, thank, thankfully. Um, just enjoying the kind of uh, the the Six Nations window that we're in at the moment. But um, I know you guys don't get don't get too much of a break during that. It, it's it's all go in the top fourteen. But we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. But um, we spoke to uh, to to James Collin, another another former Munster number eight, uh, a few weeks ago. Um, mm. Just another one of the the kind of the Munster kind of posse that's gathering uh, over there in Poe. Um, it, <laughs> it's just like a, a kind of a, a little kind of um, part of home over in uh, in France. Yeah, definitely. There's um, we've got a huge contingent to be fair of uh, Munster fellas over here with um, Dave Foley, myself, Sean Dougal, Chuckin obviously was over, and then there's um, Elliot Corcoran and Paddy Sullivan were the are the two um, video analysts, and Paddy's just uh, gone in to be. Um, train, uh, being a coach in the academy with with James, um, so we've got a big old connection with uh, Munster over here. This side, that's great. So, did you did you guys kind of um, like were you in touch with any of the lads before you went over? Was there kind of a little bit of sort of recruiting of old friends and like you know this is a good place, this is a good club. They, you know, uh, obviously you get some advice before you before you move over. Yeah, well. When I came over, obviously, I was in touch with Simon and I was in touch with James because he'd done a year here in the Pro D2. Um, 
yeah. first of all, and obviously they got promoted. And then, um, yeah, from what I was getting back from, obviously that's from them was that it was real positive and it was a club that was pretty ambitious. And, um, and that's that's the way it's been. And then obviously Dave came over um, last year. Last year was his first season and, and he, um, I think he was just looking for something new and a different experience. And he was on the phone and um, just asking what it was like. And I just, I just gave him a brief description and he seemed to love the move ever since. So, yeah, it's been pretty good. Paddy, the, the idea to go abroad in, in the first place was a, was a pretty brave one, especially at the time that you did it. Like, I'm wondering when you were growing up and there was a dream always to play for Munster or did the idea of playing you know in France or further fields ever appeal to you um the dream is obviously always to play with Munster but I, I I just got a bit frustrated at my time so I was looking for just kind of something new just to get my get my teeth into and um obviously the opportunity was 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 an easy one with having a connection with Simon Mannix and and James Collin already here in a to build a base and that I wasn't going someplace that was completely strange either that I, I did know some familiar faces in in a different club um, I probably didn't uh, I'm over here for this is my fourth season I probably starting out I didn't think <clears throat> I'd be over here for four seasons I thought it might have been a short term okay. thing but uh, I just really liked it and um, playing a lot of rugby and it's going well so. Yeah, it's hard to change when when things are going pretty decent. And was it much of a culture shock to come into a, the French step? Like we always hear, and especially from the outside, it kind of looks like almost a different sport at times. Like there's a real kind of separate style there. Like, did you find that transition difficult? Um, not not too difficult to be fair. Um, obviously you've got a great base when you're coming from Munster. You, you've like. The, the work you, over, you do over there is huge with mm. skill coaches, with just with everything as, as an organization. It's brilliant. Um, but the one difference over, over here is a lot more physical, to be fair. Um, teams are a lot heavier. You've got a lot of heavier fellas. They've got bigger squads. Um, and they play a different kind of brand of, of rugby. It's kind of more maybe bash, bash, and then give it to the backs who are pretty agile, to be fair. You, you've got some bash as well, but... They're, it's pretty agile and it's pretty fast out of the, out of the backs. Um, but yeah, the big difference is just the physicality in, in the collisions and and that the Pro 12 um, as a league is probably a faster league. But over here, it's a lot more physical. I'm kind of curious about the the move. Like the, it's almost like the life of a professional rugby player these days. You know, is that that it might bring you kind of further afield. You made the decision to go four years ago. It wasn't as regular a thing as it is for Irish players to go to France now I remember hearing Paul O'Connell talk about it after you know but like it didn't work out obviously as a player in the end for him but talking about like <laughs> that decision to go and move your life to another country to learn a new language to do all of that um how it was both a challenge and an opportunity at the same time that a lot of people don't have like I, I get that there's obviously a lot of Irish people over there, but you're still living and working in France and mainly among French people. How have you adjusted to that kind of um, in your life rather than even just in rugby over the last four years? Um, yeah, you see, I came over. I came over on my own, so I didn't yeah. have um, children to look after. So all I kind of was thinking about is my is myself because my girlfriend is, lives back home in Ireland. Um, so I was kind of just looking after myself. I'm sure it'd be a lot more difficult if you have a family to try and get them to settle in with schools and whatnot. Um, so my transition transition was relatively easy, but challenging at the same time. With the language was difficult. Um, yeah, not too many people speak uh, speak English over here or, or speak English well, but um, a lot of the players actually speak do speak English because they've had foreign players here before and they've picked up words and mm. all that. But they they do like you to make an effort. So we we like I'd speak French to the French players here or try my best, and they sometimes they try and um, improve their English so they'll speak in to me in English and I'll answer back in French. So they definitely really like when you make an effort with the language and. And, and culture-wise, it's um, the town here itself is um, is pretty pretty nice. It's um, you've got a view, um, par- panoramic view of the Pyrenees, and you're 50 minutes to Biarritz to the beach. So it's uh, it's a pretty nice place in in, uh, in France to live. So um, yeah, that was pretty pretty good. The the Six Nations obviously hasn't gone that well for France. I'm wondering, like, what has the reaction been? there to it like are you conscious of the fact that there's this talk about like a camping crisis and this kind of thing um yeah it's it, i actually find with the french team it's just that there's there's actually 30 professional teams here in, in france with the pro mm-hmm. team 
and the top 14. And it's just a lot of players. Um, and there's not a much consistency throughout the team. If you look at it selection-wise, as in there's some person plays well and they deserve to come in, but you just get a lot of players in the mix continuously throughout the years and it's that's kind of a big downfall whereas in Ireland you can see that you know you've got your 30 players and that's 30 players that are going to be playing for the next couple of years unless you get one or two fellows coming in every time um, and the public over here they are pretty impatient I think with it because they they, they believe that they should be a lot better um, obviously but with with the big championship at the top 14 and with so many good players quality players that they should be better like it's yeah, what are they? Are they ranked tenth in the world now, or something like that? Uh, something like, which is crazy for France. France should always be in the top in the top four. So they've started bringing in new rules with the GIF, um, so that trying to get foreigners kind of out of or less foreigners in in the teams. But I don't really think that's the issue. I, I, I'm not too sure, really, to be honest. Um, yeah, maybe it might come down to coaching as well as the. I think the coaching um, maybe system is a bit better in England, Ireland and New Zealand and, and that kind of side where it's a lot more detail to the game that they probably don't have over here. That's an interesting point you make there because that's, I think, uh, something that we hear a lot f- f- like looking in from the outside about maybe the application and training. I heard that Dunica Ryan referenced the even strength and conditioning standards that he was used to when coming to France. Like, Have you found certain standards lesser in terms of your training approach or even just in general? Um, oh, we're in, yeah, we're kind of lucky in, in the club here because we've got a lot of um, most of our coaches are actually foreign. Um, so yeah. we've, we've brought like we kind of had the same structure or do have the same structure that I, I was used to back in Munster. We kind of that's the template that that is over here. So I think I'm from I can only talk from my experience and my experience that it's pretty it is very professional and it's your training and your you've got all your reviews and like so we we are kind of on the same level. As what what I'm used to, but um, I've heard in other cases in different clubs, it's not the case. So I can only talk in my uh, experience, but my experience has been that it is like it is very professional over here at the moment in pole. But then again, who who knows in the other ones? Yeah, I'm interested on like obviously your perspective is from the club game, but like a lot of the time from the outside looking in, there's a kind of a whether it's the the GIF and the foreign players or whether it's just an overemphasis on the club game in general and the money that's in that that's affecting. The, the international team it, it was interesting to me when we were chatting a little bit earlier where you're saying that you guys have a game this weekend when obviously France are playing Scotland in the Six Nations you know whereas like obviously even as the Pro 14 rumbles on as the Premiership rumbles on I'd like the, the games aren't happening at the same you know on the same weekend as, as the international weekends like is is there is there almost not enough um, reverence given to the, to the to the national team do you think um, I'm not. Oh, I'm not too sure. I, I just think the problem over here is there's so many. As in, like we've got so the top 14, so you've got 26 games in the domestic league, and then you've got your European games as well. Yeah. So it's, it's a lot of rugby to try and get through, I and mean, it's a relatively short season. So I think they're just trying to make make do with the best time they can to fit everything in. Otherwise, it just carries on too late. And like I think the final this year could be mid mid June and. Players are, like the French players are looking to get ready for World Cups and stuff. It's yeah. quite a difficult season. Um, but yeah, there's like uh, I think like all the, it is from what I talk when I'm talking to the French lads, it is their huge ambition is to play with France. Obviously, all of them want to really play with France. But it's just the top 14 is massive as well. At the same time, it's huge as in like it's it's what they want to win as well. So. On a more general note then, Paddy, um, we've had Max McFarland and Shane O'Leary both on this show who are both Irish rugby players who developed in Ireland. Uh, in Ma- Shane's case, he was also a developer through Munster and ended up moving abroad. And I think that the race that academies are now churning out players, that's going to become a more viable option. Like From your own experience, which seems to have been very positive, do you think it's a good option for young developing Irish players that to look further afield? Yeah, well... well <sighs> From my experience, I can only talk from my experience. It's been, mm-hmm. it's been like, like it's been good. I've played a lot of rugby. I came over here to play as much rugby as I, I can, and I think I've eighty-five games or something with with Bo in the last three and a bit seasons. Mm-hmm. So um, it's I've had a, I've had a good experience. I've, other cases they might mightn't be as good, but um, I, th- I do think it's if you're not playing rugby and like for you to improve, being realistic, being realistic about it in a young age is you need to play rugby. You need to 
do the skill work and learn new skills, but you need to play to practice that really in, in match intensity. So it, it is a good option for players that aren't breaking into to teams and to, and kind of maybe st their progression is a bit stagnant. And the AIL, um, I think, is improving as well. At the same time, I think there's more emphasis on the AIL, which is which is good because a couple of years ago, there wasn't too much emphasis on the AIL. Um, and I think that's really good for players as well, that it's a more competitive league and, and the quality is probably a bit higher. Um, but at the same time, you can all, you can come over here. Maybe his young player, I think Shane um, Steve McMahon is is an example. He um, he's playing with Carcassonne in the Pro D two, and he was in the Munster Academy. Didn't get a, a development contract or a professional contract, and he's starting week in week out with a, with a Pro D two team over here. So that's a pretty good standard, and he's still relatively young, you know. So he could have probably be playing with AIL back home, and but yet he's came over here and took the opportunity to play um, Pro D two. So. You know, it is a good option, I think. Yeah. Um, just on something you were saying there a few minutes ago about the about the top 14, and just kind of on a more positive note, as, as opposed to sort of like ripping French rugby, which we're certainly not, you know, you, you guys are in, you know, an, a, an interesting situation at the league at the moment where it looks like, uh, you know, Perpignan are, are, are in a lot of trouble. Obviously, you beat them a couple of, a couple of weeks ago. And then there's a kind of a massive gap or a massive cl uh, cluster of teams um, in which yourselves are one of them around there. And it's just like having come yourself from the Pro 12 as it was then, um, which is kind of like obviously no relegation and sort of week on week off and in intensity a little bit sometimes you know or different levels of teams to a, a, a league where every game matters and as you said you want to play rugby and all you know and it's like every game is be all end all that must be like we're talking about culture changes earlier that must be a great one for you as a rugby player to kind of um, yeah yeah it's brilliant like i, I still it's like it's it's great every game in the top 14 is a massive game like most stadiums are sold out um the fans are like crazy around this especially on the south of france um and it's every game is a big game it's brilliant because like it just gives you a buzz when when you've got a stadium full of supporters and they're so passionate um that's that's a huge up like um and the thing is with the relegation every team is really really trying because you have to put out your best team because the fear of dropping down or making the top six you know so it's it's a good. I actually think it's a really good way for a championship. Obviously, it's great having security and having a, a zoned off championship as well that you can, might be able to build over a couple of years. But this is good because it's so competitive and it doesn't allow you to do that at the same time. It's even if you're having a, a bad season in the Pro 14, you can go okay, we can build for next year. Whereas over here, you, you can't yeah. do that. You know, so it's it creates the comp competitiveness and competition that you need. Do you ever get to have a, a point or uh, anything with any of the other Irish players when you come up against them across the league? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Whenever you come up against against them, it's great. You have a chat, you have a you have a beer, and you chew the fat and see how they're getting on, what's their experience like um, over here. So every, everyone's different. People have different stories, but everyone is is over here for a reason, and everyone seems to be enjoying it. Um, yeah, it's 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 nice. This is they, they, my first year. There wasn't too many, to be fair. Yeah. Gonna. It was just kind of the Irish lads in this team kind of sitting on our own sometimes. <laughs> but but um, no, it's good now. There's a, there's a lot. There's a lot of lads around the around the um, country playing. So it's brilliant going up to Paris, catching up with obviously Dunners and Zebes or Paddy Jackson and Perpignan or Duncan Casey in Grenoble. I'm probably missing a few more, but you know it's 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 brilliant having that connection with lads that you know from back home. So it's um, yeah, it's great. Definitely, definitely. Well, listen, best of luck with the rest of the season um, with Poe, even, and of course this weekend. And uh, thanks a million for talking to us, Paddy. Really enjoyed oh, it. It's been a pleasure. Anytime. Great stuff there, Paddy Butler. Um, Another ring and endorsement for the AIL. That's becoming a team from that kind of bracket of players that the, the, the potential it actually has, you know, like the Shane O'Leary touched off that as well, that it was something that really helped him uh, in terms of his developments, even Max McFarlane last week, like, that's how he eventually got scouted by yeah. by, by Glasgow. Like there's there's a real kind of possibility that there. That I I, I wonder is it is it's it such a good point. That's such a good thing to pick up on there. I hadn't even realised that. But when I, I we were down in Cork for the under twenties game, I I mentioned that, and I was speaking to a couple of people involved in the club game, and they're talking to me about how difficult it is because. One, if you get relegated, you lose all your players as a registration yeah. thing because you know, you're not allowed to have Division 2 players. And then the other part of it that's a little bit more worrying to me 
is that it's not just Munster players, say for a Munster team. It's not just Munster senior players who aren't playing for their clubs. It's the B&I Cup team. It's the under 20 team. It's the academy team yeah. players. All of them. Everybody just goes into this kind of like massive empire that is Munster or Ulster or Leinster. And I presume it's the same in Connacht now, which it probably wasn't. They were probably five, ten years later yeah. on this than everybody else. So like nobody of any kind of level is really playing AIL, except for maybe the odd game, because we talked to Mike Ruddock about, um, you know, Harry Byrne playing, you know, when he needed games. Yeah. He, and he, not even at training, he just goes and goes and plays the game for them, you know. So everybody in rugby, though, as you said, another person mentioned it there, seems to talk it up as this really important avenue. Yeah. Why is... Why are those two things not linked? Why are the uh, yes, like, authorities the, the, not doing there's, it? There's a lot of like talk about how they want the restructure and limitations and they want the place in it. And I don't. I, I think from the AIL's perspective, they don't feel like they're being engaged with enough throughout that process that they might be separate. That. But aside from that, like I think the like club rugby as as it exists, like in fundamentally, the importance of it is reinforced by the idea that people like. Play, like it, the people that it's supposed to benefit, you know what I mean? Like we all talk about merch stuff. The people who it's supposed to benefit, like players like Max or like Shane, they hint at the fact that it was without it, they wouldn't have become professional rugby players. Like mm. it, and that's just point black. Like these are guys who, in terms of Max McFarland, didn't get an academy contract, but he did get to play with Clontarf. Yeah. And because of that, he gets to play with Glasgow Warriors. Shane O'Leary, the same, was like down with Bucky's, like uh, with Down with Bucky, sorry. From that, kicked on is now pl- going to play in a World Cup, you know, he's going to yeah. play in a World Cup with Canada. Like the, I, 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 just, I wonder, is there enough, like, I think it's, um, like, in a way, like, and I, I, like I know Irish rugby, like, it's all about the provinces, it's all about player welfare programs, but you can incorporate the uh, internet, I think, by letting it exist as kind of like a safety net, like any players that might have slipped through the net or players that just might kick on to become pressure rugby players, like, not necessarily to the benefit of Irish rugby, but just for the benefit of, of themselves, you yeah. Know? Uh, which is an ongoing team. Actually, you can listen to the Max McFarland and to the uh, Shane O'Leary interview in our archive. They're all there, yeah. uh, easy to find, and worth listening to Shane O'Leary, especially Canadian uh, international, is going to be playing against the All Blacks in the World Cup. So, in itself, uh, an interesting thing. Um, just lastly, on 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 Paddy, then I just I, I I thought he had a great attitude throughout it, and like that is a I still think, you know, that it, it, he's being a professional there. You make a professional decision to go and play somewhere and you don't really think about what it's doing to your life. That seems to be the life of a professional sportsman. But you also do need to embrace it and you don't do like yeah. Garrett Bale sitting in his room playing computer games and doesn't speak Spanish after four years. Is that Even if you're brutal at languages or whatever, you go and you try and do it and Buy you try in, yeah. and be part of that culture. And we know that from here. We know that from who are the best foreign players who come to Ireland and adapt are the ones who go head first into the whole thing and become part of the community, it, you know? Like yeah. staying in the case of like someone like Dougie Howlett, you know? Yeah, like these exactly, people just embed yeah. themselves and that, that kind of allows them to kick on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, great stuff. We'll talk to, we'll, hopefully we'll talk to Paddy again uh, throughout the year or we'll talk to one of the other uh, 15 or 16 Munster lads <laughs> in <laughs> Poe trying to keep them in the top 14 and we hope they do. They're like, they're in a bit of a fight at the moment but they're, you know, they're fighting you know, not to be in the relegation playoff, but they're one of about six or seven teams and it looks like they're probably going to be okay. There's a couple of teams a little bit worse off than them in that and a lot of games still to play. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about um, Ireland, Scotland. We want to, or Ireland, Italy. I don't know why I keep thinking we're playing Scotland. It's like that game never happened two weeks ago. We're going to get your um, team for the game. But before we do, just as we were talking about um, uh, New Zealand briefly and who they'll be, they'll be playing Canada in the World Cup, uh, Super Rugby returned this weekend. A lot of people very excited. A lot of people on my Twitter timeline up very kind of early, early in the Saturday, morning yeah. on Saturday morning. It was like Christmas morning. It was. A, they won't be doing it in three or four weeks, <laughs> but you know, I do. I like the enthusiasm for now. But uh, the return of one player caught my attention. Uh, back at the Auckland Blues for the third time in his career, thirty-six-year-old Man Anu. Unfortunately, they lost by two points to um, at Eden Park to Ron Nogaris Crusaders, but. Uh, a very good performance from from Nanu and his aim, he states, is to get back in the New Zealand team after his European sojourn and uh, back in for the World Cup. It makes 20, at thirty six years old. Yeah, it makes nearly thirty seven by the time the World Cup comes. That uh, that Blues partnership will be certainly interesting now. Like to see Manamu and Sonny Bill Williams together, yeah. like one player who's 
brilliant at his offloads and one player who's great at taking that break like they seem custom made for each other yeah if only um, Nani was five years younger yeah, exa- yeah. yeah exactly yeah especially with the division that he that he used to have we don't know that he still yeah. have it like the last two times he was at the Blues it kind of didn't work out no it was it's, disastrous yeah, yeah, yeah but it seems to first time it seems to be slightly better and a bit better it's an interesting one to watch like it's a nice idea to see like the, the comeback kid and yeah you love players like that though and I think that's one of the things that is lost in the kind of New Zealand guys going off. We see Dan Carter signed for Racing again yeah. for another year and Julian Savea. Like was, we could talk about New Zealand players all, for the entire show. Julian Savea basically being sacked by Toulon, uh, you know, for apparently not trying, but he's going to turn up anyway. It's a whole thing. Um, so there's a lot going on there. But but what they lose is they go, they take the money end of their career. You can't blame them. No, uh, it's like, you know, not too f- unlike what Sean O'Brien's going to do after the World Cup or whatever. Like, they do that in New Zealand. But you do lose this kind of, like, autumn of the career. Like, my God, is Mananu at 36 still good enough for the All Blacks? Like, he might be. Yeah. But we'll find, but at least then he's playing down there now and we'll know over the course of the next few months. Like, no, yeah. And it's a nice kind of, like, in a competition kind of as one sided as Super Rugby, which can often be, it's a nice kind of sub narrative thing to keep you, like, Tricking along, like you tune in just to see how my was doing with the Blues, which yeah. is not necessarily something you would have watched previously. Definitely, and we'll watch as much uh, Super Rugby as possible, so you don't have to, as the <laughs> old line goes. But because we do actually like the entire point of this show is to get us ready for the World Cup, and we want to know how Australia, South Africa, New Zealand, and even Argentina, of course, are getting on sort of as we head towards. Um, towards the rugby championship and then obviously into the world cup uh, and we'll see who the players are to watch and different things like that and it look to be honest you could do worse things with your saturday morning because some of those games are just incredible yeah. like, there's just a lot of fun and it's brilliant that it's back again it means there's a lot more live rugby on tv right six nations we've barely mentioned it for the whole show which has kind of been a bit of a relief but we are playing italy and rome this week we're we, we need a bonus point win rather definitely however it is also the one game in the middle of the championship where we have a chance to maybe look at a couple of players and a couple of combinations you're joe schmidt for the next five minutes yeah. who are we going with is the match 23 you see that's yeah like there's there's a difference between what we always say this i know but what joe schmidt will do or what i think he will do and what i would like him to do and yes. I, like he obviously knows best but in saying that like there was suggestions yesterday that Murray and Sexton are both going to start I think that would be ridiculous but okay. in saying that uh, this is a, what we would like though team. yeah exactly okay, yeah, yeah this yeah. is what it's like so I start with the front row um, David Coyne I think has been the info I, I, like, I know it seems harsh on Jack McGrath who was a line but he seems that there's been a dip since then I think especially with injuries and things like that whereas David Coyne just, there's been a resurgence there um, yeah. so I think Sean Cronin we need a second choice hooker uh, Are you making think, 15 changes here? I'm, I think we should go down the Welsh mode of maybe like 9 to 10. So okay. this, so I'll actually run through the team and we can talk yeah, about okay, a couple of Yeah, okay, fine, ones. sorry. So uh, Sean Cronin, Andrew Porter, uh, your second row, Ty Byrne and James Ryan, a back row of Peter O'Mahony, Jack Conan at 8 and Sean O'Brien at 7, your halfback partnership of Kieran Marmion and Joey Carberry, a centre partnership of Robbie Henshaw and Gary Ringrose, so th- th- not much change there, and then a back three of... Conway, Will Addison, and Andrew Conway, Will Addison, and Jordan Larmer, and just to like, th- I With think Larmer on the wing, or? yeah, Larmer on the wing, okay. and Will Addison at fullback. There's like there are a couple of things that I think you that you need to bear in mind when you consider this team. Like this is a World Cup year naturally, and on that team, like what you would like is any clear number two. You know what I mean? Any clear second choice player to have about twenty five caps or 20, for Ireland. You know, you, yeah. you want them to be. Especially exposed so that in a case of injury which is inevitable they would have enough experience and right now I think a couple of those key players Andrew Porter who is like by far the, he, I think he, he's like there's no no one right now would doubt that Andrew Porter barring injury would be on the plane Andrew Porter only has 10 caps for Ireland almost all as late replacements uh, uh, as for, so for yeah, yeah coming on to a game Jack Conan, who I then again I think is the clear second choice number eight, only has ten appearances. Will Addison, who we still don't know who our second choice fullback is, and we de- desperately need one. If it is Will Addison, there seems to be a team across. A lot of people seem to have suggested that he will be the the last man on the plane, you know, because he's of his versatility. That this is something that will carry him there, and he can fit in like a Jordan Lamar as the number twenty three in in a team. He's two appearances for Ellis. Like the, so, if if that's true. Those are the kind of players that you need to like really benefit. Like they're they're the guys that you need will most benefit yeah. from this game. On top of that, then you've got someone like Ty Byrne, who like, I think is the 
closest contender to push maybe Ian Henderson or Devin Toner. And if that is the case, by playing it with James Ryan, you see how that partnership might manifest itself. Yeah. You know, that's the same. That's why I think also Henshaw and Ringrow should start because that's a partnership that like it's 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 crazy for the, we kind of in all our heads. I think we seem to kind of recognize that maybe Henshaw and Ringo's is the best sentence partnership. But the amount of game time that they get together, even at Leinster, is really minimal because of one of them is injured and another one's coming back from form. And then when Henshaw does start, he comes in at fullback against England and we know how that went. So the I think this is a good time to try and consolidate certain partnerships while also, you know, ticking up the clock for players that desperately need it. Okay, I have a few questions. Okay, yeah. Are all of, is Marmion, Henshaw, Ringrose? I uh, don't know who else he said I think just those three are they all fit Mar- Mar- yeah Marmion played for Connor at the weekend and was good uh, Ty Byrne is fit Ty he trained Byrne today. Is the other one yeah. he, he trained today we don't know Chris Farrell looks so he, took, he came off from Munster with a knock it would have been desperate to see him rule out again through injury he actually looks like he might be back fit but we, we don't know right now with the, like, yeah. uh, as we talk ideally he would be so that gives you kind of another option at 13 depending on what you want to do with, with ring rows but th- in terms of the only player that we definitely know, Riser Look is out, so he he can't play, uh, which means I think he would have definitely started. But then I think because of that, I think you have to go back to Peter Mahoney and see how that kind of back three that we only saw briefly the Scotland game, like the Conan O'Brien, yeah. Mahoney, I think you give them another chance as yeah. as a trio. Okay, I think what you've done is really pick a first choice, a uh, second row, a first choice back row, and a first choice centre partnership, and then gone with second choice all the rest of the yeah. way. So you've gone in, in bunches, which I like because you want combinations are important and everything like that. The one question I'd have for you though, for a Porter or a Kilcoyne or an Addison or a Conway or even a Marmion and Carberry, right? Is that is that experience that we're talking about? True experience, if what they're doing is basically playing in an Ireland A team. You know, so it, you know, what, like in an ideal world, wouldn't you play two players? Wouldn't you rest two players a game for the whole Six Nations and ultimately always have your full team? Yeah. You know, and yeah, it's a good, it's a, I mean, it's a good point. But I think like the, like, just to go back to like one thing that seemed to really strike uh, Ian Madigan when we went back to the 2015 World Cup was the line speed of players bursting off the back there. And that was something that he seemed to be quite kind of overawed by. And he was dropping further deeper into the pocket in 2015. And I think like Joy Carberry will only benefit, even if it isn't an Ireland team, will only benefit from having like Sergio Parise come and turn down his, his channel and having to learn to deal with that. Like, but by exposing, I remember we interviewed uh, Joy Carberry last year and I, I remember asking him about the, the Fiji game when he, when he damaged his iron and he said it was the hardest he's ever been hit was in that game. It was like they, and I mean, this was a, like that was probably an Adam B team the team that actually started that game it was during yeah. the Autumn Internationals <laughs> a match but, that we were but, very lucky to win but, if people remember <laughs> but he, very uh, lucky he um he had never been exposed to that before yeah. like he had never been exposed to that and he like he'd been playing like this was obviously pre controversial move to Munster but he'd been playing pretty consi- like irregularly with Leinster he'd been getting game time yeah. but it was still a level of so I think f- in terms of what you're exposing players to that's what it comes down to like Italy we've spoken on this podcast about how accurate their line out is like 100 percent. i think they've got the best line out record in six nations right now that's like that's a challenge for somebody like sean cronin all of a sudden he's learned to deal with against these like phenomenal jumpers and very good readers or even you know depending on if ty Byrne comes in if ty Byrne comes in he calls the line outs and so therefore he's learning to deal with it it's all it's exposure to elements that they wouldn't necessarily have been to exposed to before yeah not, not that uh not that it's a standard that they haven't been exposed to before, but just in terms of in the in an Ireland jersey in that yeah. kind of setup, I think it it, it 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 stands to them. I'll tell you where I disagree, and I I, I take your points completely on most of the guys. I definitely I wouldn't play Keith Earls. I don't think I'd play Stockdale. I don't think I'd play Sexton, although I'm not as sure about that for reasons that I'll get to in a second with somebody else. And I probably would change the majority of the front row, if not the entire one. I think you're you're, you're probably in a in a good place there. I would play Conor Murray. I think he needs as much rugby as possible. I think we need to get him in a place where he could dominate a game a little bit and be on the front foot. Yeah. And hopefully he can do that. And I just think for the confidence of a nation as well as for Conor Murray, I think we need that to happen. Sexton, the reason I'm saying him is, is the reason I would play Rob Carney is because he had one game is taken and then would ultimately have a month off before the France game and then we come back into him again I think he needs a little bit of rugby still coming back from injury and I think that we discovered and decided that we definitely need him at least for the next uh, next month 
um, if we're going to take the Six Nations in any way seriously. So I don't think you can afford to not play him when there's such a, g- a gap. Again, there is another if people don't remember, there is another gap week after this match. Yeah. So, like before we have the uh, yeah. France game, I just, I, I just, I hope, like I, I, I would be loath to delve into the kind of short termism about the what, like what does this mean in the context of the of the Six Nations? Like ultimately, like the the idea of not kind of developing depth. Like we, but you have to though because you have to still take the Six Nations for what it is. If we go and lose every game because we're experimenting for a World Cup, then we're in no position. We're in no proper situation going into a yeah. World Cup we're a decimated team that doesn't know who the pr- first 15 is or we don't have any backup or you know there's an awful lot of different things that will go into us losing the Six Nations not to mention we don't want to throw Six Nations away but I mean I guess in the context like if you look at what Wales did for example like the the only way that Warren Gatlin discovered that he and they had a same, similar alliance on Lee Halfpenny and we, they thought there was nobody close to Lee Halfpenny and then Lee Halfpenny who as it turned out, came injured, but then the Halfpenny was dropped in the Autumn Nationals, and people were like, why do they do that? And Liam Williams emerged as this phenomenal player, and he developed like a really screwed one-two. It's still the Halfpenny is still probably first choice, but he developed depth within that team by by by, by having the bravery to do that. Yeah, and I think that there are elements that Ireland don't know anymore, and the, the ultimately the idea is that like uh, injuries are inevitable, but you can plan to develop depth. Like that can be something when you, when, if you take your training shrewdly. So I, 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 would, I think I would go back to the, like Rob Kearney came back in off relative little game time and played really well yeah, last week. Enough, yeah, and so yeah, I wonder yeah. is the, and also like on the idea but of Sexton didn't play much rugby at all and then had a really poor game against England, you know? Yeah. Um, and which is fair enough. I, to be honest, like if Sexton was fully fit, I would play him. I just like the idea that he failed the HIA, and then it's coming back off that. Yeah. I just I would be like uh, if there is a possibility that you could rest him up slightly more. I would uh, I would be in favour of that. But as I said, like I there were suggestions in a couple of Sunday papers yesterday that that's not what's going to happen and that Murray and Sexton are both going to start. And I mean I can understand the reasons for that. I wouldn't necessarily agree with them. But yeah, no, fair enough. I think that I think that you have a fair point there. Is that you've outlined your reasons well as to why we should change. But there is that seeking suspicion suspicion that Joe Schmidt is not Warren Gatland. And I can't see him making wholesale changes. Uh, yeah. I think the majority of players who played, I think there will be some. I think that one or two players will surprise us and kind of come out of nowhere seemingly. And that could be Will Allison, I don't know. But I don't think it'll be, I don't think he'll change the entire front row, for example. Yeah. I just don't see it. I mean, I, yeah, I, you're probably right. I mean, I'm sure he could justify, like, this argument about, like, he could say, you know, Joey Carberry is now on 18 minutes. He basically played a full game against Scotland, so we don't necessarily need him. I'm <laughs> yeah. sure, like, the same applies to players like David Coyne, who's now 30 and has, like, sufficient exposure with most of the things. I'm just saying that I think that, the like, it, it's, I th- there's pros and cons to all of this kind of stuff, but in the context of what you're trying to do as an overall philosophy, like, looking at this yeah. year as a whole, I think that this game is a good chance to, Follow the Welsh route. And, Great. You know. Very quickly before we go, because we're out of time. Cardiff, Wales versus England. I can't wait for this game. Who's going to win? It's going to be a cracker. Yeah, I think England will win, but I think the if you like if you ever want to see what the predominant currency and how rugby has gone, I think this is the game to watch because that will just be brutal. Like this yeah. will be huge ballers. I'm I would fully expect Warren Gatland to stack his team. I wouldn't be one bit surprised if he drops somebody like Navidi, who's in our rolling team, the odds has been great two weeks in a row to accommodate these big ball carriers that he so, yeah. seems so desperate to get into his team. So I think that that game is just going to be brutal. But I can't wait for like it. if Wales win, it's going to be like like the Australia game in November. It's going to be like nine eight or yeah, something like yeah. that, isn't it? But yeah, like I can't see them holding out England for the whole game. But I can't wait for it. It's oh, going to be fascinating, yeah. and I think fans are going to beat Scotland as well. I think they're going to recover yeah turn it back yeah. on yeah yeah i do and i think ireland will obviously beat italy um obviously uh, we'll be counting uh we'll be playing that clip back to me next <laughs> week maybe if something bad happens um we'll get the team on um friday i think because we're playing on sunday it's a day later i'll be on with uh with popey um for the six nations takeaway for that and um we'll be on balls.e all week you can check out all the best six nation stuff there um and we'll be back with you next tuesday for some reaction and for another great interview so enjoy your week and we'll talk to you then